Okay, now I'm just going to also share the screen. Okay, now, okay, as I said, every, for this part of the session, as the class, you may say that it's too hot in here. Please, people at the back, if I can have your attention at the back. Yes. Now, as I said, we have multiple breaks during the session. Now we are just going to start. Okay, please make sure that if you have any questions, take a note of it, that during the 15 minutes break, we can just answer that. Or if you have a question at the same time, which I'm explaining, we can just um, immediately ask the question that possibly pops up. Okay, now today, uh, we are gonna talk about, as the title shows, we are gonna talk about the vector spaces, matrices, and tensor flows, and the good thing about the lecture today is that whatever we discuss, we are just going to run a lab session with that. I'm just going to show you how to run a Jupyter notebook on your browser and also uh, how to just, I'm going to provide you the codes as well. You can just copy paste the codes, put it on the Jupyter notebook and you execute it, which becomes very easy. Please do not talk. I get distracted there. But that, but check yourself. What about the keys in the fairy tales? The, the 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 air blows into your hair. Look at hair. <laughs> but but be careful. Once that happened to me, I just sat for almost half an hour in front of the fan. After that, I couldn't move my neck. Be careful of that. Now, anyhow, then if you see that, please. Then if you see that, if there is a question. Also, you have the chance when you run the Jupyter notebooks as part of the lab, you're going to see how it works. In terms of the assessment, the assessment is going to be very, some of the details that you see over there, it's not going to be in your assessment. The good thing is that you're just going to hear them when you just go for an interviews, or let's say when you are maybe it's triggered some interest for you, you can just continue that. But the assessments that you're going to have, it's going to be the final exam, you do not have it, as I said. But for the meantime, it's going to be so much on the surface, very easy. But the good thing is that you're going to see those kind of terminologies that we are going to discuss. First of all, I'm just going to talk about the, 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 the learning outcomes. Then we just move on to the vector spaces. The concept, listen, next time you come to. Listen, next time if I hear you. I've made you sit over here without a fan. Huh? Do not talk, okay? It's, it's for the fourth time I said that. Okay, now, then what we do today is that I'm just going to explain the basic concepts that we need all of them all the way to week 15. We're going to talk about some theories. There are not much practicality coming with that, but they are essential to know about that. We are going to talk about the vector spaces how to define a vector space, and more importantly, how can we just transform any observation in the real space into a kind of a vector into the vector space in order to do analysis with that. Now, uh, then also, we are gonna talk about, uh, somehow, we are gonna talk about the matrices, and also we are just gonna talk about the tensors, we are just going to do talk about some algebraic operations that you just do on the matrices. For important, you're going to talk about on the organ vectors and organ values. And also, we are going to talk, talk about the composition vectors, which are two important and very practical operations with the, with the matrices. Then towards the end, you're going to see that how we can just use these concepts to use the AI in the healthcare, like the films that we can come, for example, design a drug from the data that we have obtained in quantum chemistry. It's gonna be a very practical thing. You're gonna see that on the lab. There are no assessments for that. Do not worry if you say, oh, this is too much complicated. There is no, no, nothing in the assessments, either for the meta, so that there is no final exam, but uh, you are not going to be assessed about this stuff. The good thing is that you are going to see them. That in case if you go for an interview, you have a much broader perspective that you are going to have. Now, first of all, we are just going to talk about the, what is a vector space. Okay, and this is slide we define the vector space. Yes, please come in. No worries at all. 
You say that the vector space, for example, if you have two vectors, okay, at least by having your two vectors, you can create a vector space. However, please come in. You can have a vector space. I give it a couple of more seconds that the people. <laughs> oh, it was gang, you're back. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah, I, I, uh -huh. guys, let's let's continue. We're going to talk about the vector space. I said that everyone knows what is a vector, huh? You have seen that in the high school. You see that in the high school, for example, if you have a two points into the space, you connect these two points together. What do you get? You get the line. But if you assign a direction to that line, for example, you, 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 you draw a line, you assign a direction to that, either that direction or that direction, you have created a vector. And now you're going to see that by having at least two vectors, you can create a space that is, becomes the vector space. It becomes very crucial and fundamental things that you're going to see that at the end of the session this week. And also by week 15, you are using that very simple concept in order to design algorithms that you use the data, for example, molecular geometry, molecular energy, and entropy to extract those data, which you have taken them from the techniques in the quantum chemistry, use the concepts of the vector space, which it seems very, very not practical, but essentially it's very practical to construct a chemical molecule that sometimes you can validate it to just act in, for example, as a kind of a drug. And it becomes very important. As I said, this part that you're just gonna rebuild and construct a chemical molecule from some data sets like molecular geometry or entropy, you're not gonna be assessed on that for the exam, but you're gonna see that on the labs that we are running them. Now, we talk about, okay, the key properties of the vector spaces. Before I just talk about the properties, remember on the next slide, I'm just going to highlight eight principles that these principles is important in order to assess that you have constructed a vector space at least by two or three vectors. I'm going to talk about those concepts. In the next two slides, we call it eight axioms to reconstruct a vector space, but there are two, three key properties of the vector spaces that we are just going to use them in the coming sessions. First of all, we talk about the closures. We say closed, the vector spaces are closed on their vector addition and a scalar multiplication. multiplication. You're going to see that on the next, next slide. slide. It means that if you have two vectors, if you add them together, the resulting vector, for example, you have vector A, you have vector B, you add them together, the resulting vector, and if you please uh, mute me on your system, Adita, is it you? <laughs> I, I remember from the chemistry class that it's probably you. Am I right? Yeah, sir. No. Very, very naughty girl. Who is, who is on? Let me see. Let me, let me see who's the culprit. No one. Everyone is mute. Okay. Now, yeah, we're just going to say that, uh, by the way, guys, I said that every 25 minutes of the lecture for the people who relate to the class, every 25 minutes, I'm going to give you 15 minutes break, then we continue from there. Okay, look at that, how happy he looks. <laughs> now, we said that if you have two vectors, for example, you have vector A, you have vector B, like the numbers, you can add them together, but provided that you just keep the directionality, then the closure, it means that if you add two vectors, the resulting vectors, it is also a component of that vector space. And also you can multiply that to a scalar. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. Now, the, another property is that the concepts of the zero vectors. Zero vectors is, you're going to see that. You have seen that also. We call it a vector that all the components of that vector are zero. This is an element of the vector space. Any vector spaces contains a zero vector. And also, 
We talk about the existence of additive inverse vectors. We're gonna talk about that on the next slides that we're gonna see now. Then you remember at this slide, what we discuss about is that when we have two or three vectors, we can from them, we can build a space that it comes with eight characteristics. We are gonna talk about those characteristics later, eight axioms. Now you may wonder as an example of the vector space, you can talk about the Euclidean space. For example, the two dimensional space, you remember for the physics class last week, we said that you have a reference frame X and Y axis, every point or every events into that space comes with two elements, components, X and Y, this represents a vector space, a Euclidean in two dimensions. If the dimension is two, you call it what? You call it, let's say, a plane, like the plane of this board, or the n, the dimension is three, you call it space, like the space of this class. Now, I'm gonna talk about very briefly about these eight axioms that, take a sip of that, it's, it, it cools you down. <laughs> we talk about, we talk about these axioms. These axioms are a little bit abstract, but it's good to know them. We said that when we talk about, it is important for the, for the assessment problem to know these axioms. First of all, we say that if we call a space, a vector space, it has to have eight properties. The first property is closure under addition. It means that if you have two vectors, U and V, which belongs to that space, you add them together, again, the resulting addition is a component, a data, into that vector space. Now, we talk about commutativity of the additions. We said that if you have built a vector space, if you choose arbitrary two vectors from that space, if you add U and V together, it doesn't matter if you add U and V, you need the space. Look at that, U plus V, it's the same as V plus U. It means that commutativity. Now, we just, we are gonna talk about the third property. We said that now, you're talking about the vector space. You're gonna see the significance of that vector space in a couple of sessions from now that we talk about the vector space that you use the vector space in order to build your algorithms on that to predict the molecular draw. You see that if you have a vector space with three vectors, U, V, and W, there is associativity of the additions. It means that if U, V, and W are vectors, you see that U plus V plus W is the same as U plus V plus W. You see that you can in additivity, you can associate it, for example, two with the third one and so on. There are so very elementary properties. Number four, we said that the existence of additive identity, we talked about that the zero vectors, we said that the zero vectors in any dimensions, two, three, or any dimensions, it's a vector which the elements are zero. It doesn't come with the length, we call that zero vectors. We said that if you define a vector space, if there is a zero vector there, the addition of that zero vector to that vector gives back to the same vector in that space. That's existence of additive identity, as long as the zero vector exists there. Now, we talk about existence of additive inverses. It was the third quant property on that slide that I said that I'm gonna talk about that later. We said that for every vector, into that vector space, you can define an inverse of that vector, symmetrical with respect to the zero, which we call that minus V. There's a, you, you can visualize a vector space. There is a, there's a vector there as V. There is also a corresponding vector minus V, which if you add them together, you get the zero vector, which is very obvious. That's what you call that closure under, uh, sorry, existence of additive inverses. It means the vector at its inverse, you can add them together to get the zero vector, okay? Now we have another one, I, uh, identity number six. We call that the closure under scalar multiplication. We said that if there is a vector space, 
You find a vector in that space. You multiply that vector into a scalar, like for example, the scale like two, three, any numbers. If you multiply that vector belonging to that space to a scalar, the output is another vector, either contract or expanded, which that vector also still belongs into that sp vector space. Can you see that? C is a scalar belonging to the F, V is a vector belonging to the V, the vector space, the CV still belongs to that vector space. That's closure on the scalar multiplication. The other one, the other property that we're gonna discuss is gonna be the distributivity of the scalar multiplication. You see that, for example, if you had C times U, U times C times U plus V, equals Cu plus Cv, you can expand that scalar into that addition that you have. Now, and also the eighth one is gonna be the, the, the thing that's similar to that, that we discussed. Now, uh, now, I'm just gonna wrap it up, the session that we had at this part, by having this example onto the vector spaces, because from vector space, what we have discussed so far, we are just gonna expand it into a practical tool, which is called matrices. You are gonna see that matrices is a very important mathematical tools. You're gonna see that also, for example, if you happen to choose your project in, for example, image analysis, you can see that you can represent an image for example, the CT scan of the brain in terms of the matrix. Now, we are just gonna talk about that more towards the end of the semesters. For example, you see that everyone knows what is the MRI scan. Everyone has, you're coming from the health science background. You're gonna see that if you choose that project, they're gonna also talk about that. If you choose that project by week 10 from the website, which I'm gonna talk about that today. For example, you choose a project, for example, you are just gonna detect the brain tumor, for example, medulloblastoma, which is a very active pediatric brain cancer. And if you have, let's say, for example, MRI or CT scan of the brain, you see that then you just want to analyze that, you can represent that image MRI scan with a matrix of just pure numbers. Then in that case, you do not work with that image. You are working with the matrix of the numbers. That we're going to talk about that after the break. However, before we talk about the matrices, I'm going to finish this session before we just go for a short break about an example of uh, the vector spaces. I talked also about that, about the Euclidean spaces. As I said that, a Euclidean space depends on the dimension. For example, the Euclidean space of two dimension, it becomes like what? Of the plane of the board that you have there. You can always visualize there are two axes, for example, X and Y, which these ones create these two dimensional Euclidean space as a plane. Now, if the dimension becomes three, you can look at it as a space in this classroom. Now, look at the vector space. For example, I'm just going to propose a vector space like the one which I have shown there. V in our space comes with X, y and z x is one y is two and three is the z components that everything comes in this bracket as an array huh then you see that the operations if i come with another vector for example four five six if i add these two vectors together vector u vector v you see the resulting addition which is elements by elements addition. One plus four gives you the resulting five. Two plus five gives you the resulting seven. And three plus six gives you the resulting number of nine. You see that this resulting vector into the three-dimensional Euclidean space again exists in this space. It is, it is very obvious. If you have two vectors in this room, you add them together, you see that the resulting again is somewhere in the same space that we constructed. And that confirms the additivity principle of the 
vector spaces. Now, scalar multiplication has something different. For example, you see that if you have the same vector that we started with, one, two, three, if you can find a scalar number, like number three, then what is the result of this scalar into this vector is the elements by elements multiplication. You have three times one becomes three, three times two becomes six, three times three becomes nine. The resulting vector, which is three, six, nine, again, it is somewhere in the same vector space in this classroom space. If you look at this classroom as that three-dimensional Euclidean space, then you see that this multiplication is the same. You can also continue with the other six axioms. For example, one, two, and three, it can come with its own reverse. The reverse of one, two, three, you multiply that by one minus. Then one, two, three, its inverse become minus one, minus two, minus three. You add this one to the same original vector, you get minus one plus one becomes how much? Zero. Minus two plus two becomes zero. Minus three plus three becomes zero. Then you get what? A vector which its all elements become zero, zero, and zero. That what we call that a zero vector into that vector space. And of course, that zero vector is in this space. You see that again, this is also one of those properties that for each vector into that vector space, you can find its inverse, you can add it to the original vector, you get the zero vector. And that's a very important axiom that we discussed. Now, it was one example of the vector spaces. Before I just wrap up the session, before we just go for the break, I'm just gonna guys remind you, from the next week, you are gonna see that we are just talking about the vector space all the time. We are gonna see that for whatever happens, for whatever manifestation into the universe, if you wanna analyze it, you have to numerically transform it into a vector, part of the vector space. For example, if you see an MRI image of a brain tumor, the beauty of that is that you can represent that as a vector into the vector space and also as a matrix, which it shows the intensity of those pixels there. Then the thing that we discussed also very abstract is the foundation of many things that we're just going to do from next week, okay? Next, after that, when you just come back from the short break, I'm going to talk about the matrices becomes a very important tool for our future analysis. Any questions so far? No? Everyone is happy, happy? Okay, now, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to stop, we take a short break, then we come back. I'm going to share the screen again. Okay. Now, okay, what time is it now? Then we go for the next round. Everyone's listening to me? Awesome. Now, now we are just moving to a, a concept which is so important. Isn't that? Do you believe me that is important at the back? Yes? Yes? Then are you going to listen? <laughs> okay, fantastic. Now, we're going to talk about in the next um, the session, in this session, in the next 25 sessions, 25-minute session on the concepts of the matrix and matrices. This is a very fundamental concept. We are going to use that extensively from next week and also from today. Every representation of the things of the vectors, either we use a matrix or a tensor, and we talk about the tensor after the next uh, break that we're going to talk about that. Now, anybody has seen the concepts of the matrix back in your studies? Everyone has seen it, huh? Then I'm just going to walk through it. Anybody who hasn't seen the concepts of the matrix before? I guess everyone has seen it. Yes? Now, oh, the movie. <laughs> That's my favorite movie as well. Now, I'm just going to walk through that very quickly. There are two concepts of the matrices that we just use the algebra for the organ vectors and organ values as singular value decomposition. I'm just going to stop over there to make more time to explain that. But before that, about the preliminaries, I'm walking too fast. 
you know, everyone knows the matrix is an array of the numbers. For example, if you have a couple of vectors, you can push them together instead of having a one column vectors or one row vectors, you have an array of the numbers that you call it the matrix. Now, we call that the matrix in terms of the notation. We said that the A, it comes, it belongs to the Euclidean spaces of R, M, and N. You remember from before of your studies, M represents the number of the rows of that matrix. N represents the number of the columns of that matrix. Some basic algebraic operations of the matrices is the addition and subtraction. You remember that from your prior studies that the two matrices, you can add them together or subtract them together if they have the same rank. It means that they have the same number of the rows and the same number of the columns that you can subtract or add them element-wise. Element added to the corresponding elements in the other matrix. We talked about the multis, we are gonna talk about the matrix multiplication, either to another matrix or to a scalar, which is something you have seen it before. And we talk about the transpose of the matrix. You're just gonna see that it's a very important operations for the matrices for our future um, algorithms. And also we talk about the inverse of a matrix. The inverse of a matrix is like inverse of a number. For example, you see a number like five. What is the inverse of five? One over five. What is a characteristic of the inverse of a number? If you multiply them together, you get number one. Five times one over five, the two inverse of each other gives you what? Gives you one. Huh? Then when we talk about the matrices, you're gonna see that later, that if there is a matrix, and there is its corresponding inverse. If you multiply them, you get the unit matrix. It means matrix, which is has a diagonal elements all one. Other elements is going to be zero. You're just going to see that when when we just go to uh, the other concepts. There are some examples there on this slide. You see that, for example, we talk about, uh, for example, the addition. It's something you have seen it before. I have two matrices, A and B. There are two square matrices because both of them comes with two rows, with two columns. There are two by two matrices. Every element shows which row they stand and which column they stand. For example, A12 at the matrix A, it means that that's an element that is lo lo located in the first row, but the second column, right? That's something familiar for you. Now, you see that when you want to add them together to make the matrix C, you see that you add them or subtract them element-wise. Element at first row, first column, is going to be added to the same corresponding element at matrix B, which is at the first row and first column. You say A11 plus B11. And that shows a corresponding elements by element addition or subtraction. As an example, something at the below, matrix A, one, two, three, four, matrix B, five, six, seven, eight. You see that when you add them together, you add element wise. One plus five becomes six. Two plus six becomes eight. Three plus seven becomes 10. And four plus eight becomes 12. And that's so easy. You have seen it before. Now. We talk about the multiplication of the matrices. We do not talk about the multiplication in terms of the scalar into a matrix, which you remember you have to multiply that the scalar lump, like number two to all elements of that matrix. We talk about the multiplication, which is a matrix into a matrix. There is a trick if you remember to do that. Look at that. Matrix multiplication, you have to have, follow one rule. Look at the formula that we have in the middle of the page over there. If you have a matrix which belongs to a Euclidean space, which comes with the M row and N columns, you see R on top M times N, means the matrix that you have comes with M rows and N columns. And you see another matrix comes B, which it comes again. It belongs to the Euclidean space, which this time the dimension is n multiplies to p, means n, n rows, p columns. 
Look at that. In order to make them multiplica multiplicable, the number of the columns of the first matrix, which is N, should match the number of the rows of the second matrix, which is N. Then the resulting matrix A times B is M times P. You have seen that before, huh? In your prior study, you have seen it, the matrix multiplication. Yes? We are suspicious. Have we seen it or not? Now, then you see as an example, I'm just going to walk fast on that because something you have seen it before, matrix A, matrix B, you multiply them together. We are so lucky because both of them are two by two matrices. The, the columns of the first matrix equals the row of the second matrix, which both of them are two. But the resulting matrix is two by two itself. When you multiply them together, you follow the sigma matrix that you have there, you get the result of the matrix A times B, which is written there. For example, how to get there, the first element, as a kind of a reminder. Are you listening? As a kind of a reminder. For example, you have 19 which is standing on the first row and first column. How to get it there? It just comes from what? What is the identity of that element in the resulting matrix? It is one times one, first row, first column. It means that in order to get that, you have to multiply first row of the first matrix to the first row of the first column of the second matrix. 1 times 5 plus 2 times 4, 2 times 7. 5 plus 14 becomes 19. Huh? Does it make sense? You have seen it before. Huh? Some people say yes, some people say no. But I assume that you have said it. We do not rely much on the matrix multiplication. We need more kind of more advanced stuff. That's why I'm just gonna go through. If you can't remember it, let me know. I'm just gonna solve one of the matrix multiplication for you, but you do not need that for the assessment purposes. But that's a kind of reminding. I'm just gonna show that to you. The things that you need for the assessment purposes are in the next slides. I'm just gonna stop on them to explain it more. Now, we talk about the transpose of the matrix. What does it mean to transpose of the matrix? It means that if you have a matrix which has, for example, n, for example, m row, n columns, you transpose it means that you change the, the columns with the rows. For example, look at the matrix which I have A over there. I have the first row, which is one, two. I have the second row, which is three and four. The matrix transpose of it, which is, I call it by A, like it comes to the poverty, but this is not the poverty. That's the symbol notation that it shows that this is a transpose. T comes from the transpose, is that you have to look at the original matrix and convert the columns into the rows or rows into the columns. Look at the matrix A. What is the column there, the first column? One and three, matrix A, huh? The matrix transpose, one and three, it shows at the first row. And that's the purpose of the transposing. You change the columns into the rows or rows into the columns, doesn't matter. Matrix A, what is the second column? Two and four. Then on the matrix transpose, you see two and four is as what? The second row. The second column of the first matrix becomes the second row of the transpose matrix. And that's the concept of the transposition. Sometimes we need to transpose a matrix in order to do an algebraic things that you're going to see that after our next break when we talk about that. Now, any questions so far? Adita, you look to have a question. Speed it up, brother. Ask it. Okay, now. Now, I'm just going to talk about the inverse of a matrix.
Now, the inverse of the matrix, what is that? You see that we talked about that before. We said that when we talk about the, the number, like for example, number five, the inverse of number five is one over five. What is the characteristics of that? Is that when you multiply a number to its inverse, five times over one five becomes one. We have the same concept in matrices, but finding the inverse of a matrix is not as easy as inverse of a number. I say, I give you a number like seven. I ask you, what is the inverse of that? You say, ah, one over seven. For a matrix, the inverse becomes a little bit more work. But how to do that? It's the thing that you need to also know that for the assessment, for the midterm. For example, look at this one. There is a formula for the inverse. You need to know the inverse of the two by two matrices, not three by three. First of all, remember that the inverse of a matrix is only limited if the matrix is a square. What is a square matrix? It means that the matrix that it has the same number of the columns as the same number of the rows. A matrix is a square like, for example, two by two matrix, three by three matrix, four by four matrix. We call them a square matrix. That the number of the rows equal the number of the columns. These matrices only they have the inverse. For example, look at this one, the formula. Please remember this formula. You need to use that for the mean term assessment. For example, if the matrix is like this arrangement, like A, A, B, first row, C, D, the second row, you see that the inverse of this matrix is given like that. You have to first find the inverse of its determinants. I'm going to, on the next slide, explain that. A times D, 1 over A times D minus B over C. That's the inverse of the determinant of that matrix. On the next slide, you're going to see that more. And now you have, you change the position of the main diagonal, which is A and D. You swap them. And B and C, you multiply them by minus one. And the resulting is the inverse of that matrix. On the next slide, Let me let me go there. Okay, we talked about this. Okay. Uh, yes, I'm just gonna use this slide when when it comes to talk about the inverse of the matrix. I skipped some slides to get to this example before we just go for our next short uh, break. Look at that. We just start with this matrix. As I said, I'm just going to remind you once more that the matrix can be inversed under two conditions. First, it's a square matrix. It means that the number of the columns matches the number of the rows. Second, the determinants of that number is not zero. The determinants of that matrix is not zero because you need the inverse of that determinants. If determinant is zero, you cannot have a number divided by zero. It becomes meaningless. Now I'm just going to talk about that more in details. That's what you need to do for the meter, for example. Look at the matrix that you have there as an example. I have the matrix one, two, three, four. It's a square matrix with the rank two, means that two columns, two rows. First thing is that we see, oh, if this is a square matrix, it's a good sign because we can think of its inverse because inverse of the matrix is only relevant if a matrix is a square. Now, then I have to take some steps to do that. The first step is that I have to take a couple of steps. First step is to make the minors of that matrix. You do not, it doesn't matter if you call it whatever, but more important is that you follow these steps. The first thing is this, look at that. The original matrix, I had one, two, three, four. The minors, what is the difference between that? I swapped one and four on the main diagonal. Look at one and four at the first matrix. I swapped them. Now one become four, four become one. I swapped their place. The second thing which I did, I did the same thing for off diagonal elements. 
after and it was again it swapped three it was initially at the second row first column now it is swapped to the first row second column take a closer look to these two matrices a and minor do you see the difference huh do you see the swapping happen yes is it clear for everyone awesome then the next step which i'm just going to do is that i'm just going to find the cofactors of that matrix. What does it mean? Look at the cofactors matrix. If I go back to the first matrix, you see four, three, two, one. You see four minus three minus two, one. It means that I moved from minors matrix into the cofactors matrix by multiplying the off diagonal elements into minus one. In the minors, I had three, two. In the cofactors, I have minus three, minus two. You see that? Huh? Sounds easy so far? Now, the next step, I'm just going to transpose it. The cofactors is going to be transposed. How to transpose the mind matrix? We talked about that before, in two minutes before. We said that a transpose matrix is a matrix that... Anywhere you see, a, 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 let's say, a row, you shift it to become a column. Look at the cofactors. What is the first row? Four minus three. Oh, I see a row. In order to build a transpose, I have to shift it to a column. Look at this. Count the cofactors four and three. Put your hand on top of four and three. Push it to come down. You see four remains there. Minus three comes to bottom. That means the row that you had over there, you hinge it against four. You turn it into become a column. The same thing at the co at the co at the cofactors minus two one cofactor matrix minus two one. This is a second row, huh? Now the second row turns to be my second column in the transpose matrix. You see at the adjugate, the adjugate, now I have, look at that, minus three and one becomes minus three and one as a row. You see minus three, one of the cofactors, the second column now becomes the second row at the adjuvate. Don't I don't care what you call them, but remember the process, what to do, huh? Then the next step is that the final step is this to multiply the adjuvate that you had to the determinants of that matrix. What are the determinants? DETA, the adjuvate is the one that we got up. up. The, ad, the determinant is this. Let me go back to this slide. I skipped many. Look at that. The formula that I have over there, the matrix A, when it is A, B, C, D, on the right side, you have D minus B minus C, A. This is the adjuvate. But one over A times D minus B times C. The product of the diagonal minus product of off-diagonal becomes the determinant of that matrix. You have seen it before, I'm sure. Huh? Then the inverse of the determinants times the adjuvate gives you the inverse of that matrix. And what is having done here. You see that the A minus one, which is the inverse of that matrix, is one over determinant of the A times adjuvate. Okay, adjuvate, we have it four minus two, minus three, one. What is the determinant? Look at the matrix A. A times four becomes how much? Four. Three minus two, sorry, three times two becomes six. Then four minus six becomes how much? Minus two. That you see, you have one over minus two here, the inverse of the determinant. Then the inverse of the determinant times the adjuvate gives you the inverse of the function. Do you want me to use the whiteboard to explain it to you? Or that's the reminder and the refresher, you know what happened. 
Everyone's okay with that? Or do you want me to just put that on the whiteboard? Everyone's okay? Yes? Awesome. Now, then you see as a result, the inverse becomes like that. Now, you can test it. Multiply the inverse to the matrix itself. You see that. You get the matrix that all the elements become zero except the diagonal, which is everything is going to be one. And that's, that's a property of the inverse of the matrix, which I have this on this slide. I said that the key point is that the inverse of matrix A is denoted as A like to the power minus one. It doesn't mean a power of minus one. It's the symbol notation to show that this is the inverse. The most important thing is the one that I discussed right now. The product of a matrix into its inverse, it gives you an identity matrix. What is an identity matrix? Is a matrix, you are gonna see that and then after the break, that the matrix, a square matrix, that all the elements are zero, except the elements on the diagonal, which everything is gonna be one. That becomes identity matrix. Now, and the matrix must be non-singular for inverse to exist. What does it mean? I'm just gonna go back to the example which we had over there. Guys, imagine the matrix that we started with, matrix A, imagine the determinant of the matrix was zero. Then for the inverse, you say one over determinant of the A times the adjuvate. If the determinant was zero, you have one over zero, which is meaningless in algebra. You cannot divide any number by zero. Then if a matrix determinants become zero, we cannot look for its inverse because you can never find a meaningful result from one over zero. Then anywhere, that's a trick for the mean term probably, that any time that you have been given a question to find the inverse of that matrix, you have to be careful that the determinant of the matrix is not zero. If it becomes zero, it becomes an, a singular matrix. And the singular matrix, they do not have the inverse one because one over zero, it's meaningless. Then the key point is that for the meter, if you have a question that you're asked to find the inverse of the matrix, first check if the matrix is non-singular, means that its determinant is not zero. If it's zero, you said that the inverse doesn't exist for that matrix. Sounds okay, everyone? Okay, now, okay. Now, before we just go <clears throat> for uh, the next topic, the next topic essentially, I can say that this is one of the most important slides that we have for today, and one of the most important thing that you are just going to see that for, uh, no, you're just going to see very more important stuff coming up, but this slide is so important. And it comes with very practical applications. And the practical applications, what? <laughs> and you know what's the funny thing is that you are sitting in front of the fan, and the funny thing is that when you talk the words, it's, there is, I'm just joking, there is nothing something like that. The words, it comes through the blowing of the fan and it comes to my ear much faster. <laughs> and much louder. You can imagine the wind of the fan coming and your words over there <laughs> comes much faster to me. Now, the next topic, I'm just gonna do a quick review on that before we just go for the next break. This is called Ogen Vectors and organ value. And we are just gonna do our lap on this one, on the simulation you're gonna do on these two techniques. The first thing is this, in the practical applications, we are just sometimes, uh, for example, you're gonna see that in, uh, let's say, uh, in big data analysis, for example, sometimes in molecular biology, part of the health science program that you have studied, Sometimes you just 
look at the tumor's tissue. And you can just do, for example, axon sequencing or whole genome sequencing to find, for example, or RNA sequencing to find the expression of the genes in the tumor, which it comes with multiple different of the subpopulation of the cells. Then when you have, for example, a cancerous tissue with the gene expression, you see that if you have worked with those kind of data sets, you see that there are many genes and many expressions. When you just want to visualize it, you see that sometimes you have 3,000 genes with the expressions of that. You cannot visualize it because you have two-dimensional space. How is it possible to show a 3,000 dimension vector space into the map of the board, which is two dimension? Then you have to find some clever way that those 3,000 genes expression, you crunch it into a meaningful representation that you can visualize those 3,000 expressions of 3,000 genes where the expressions becomes, uh, let's say, uh, most show the most variances. This kind of stuff that you do that on, let's say, uh, very practical things in bioinformatics, health sciences, those stuff, all of them are the result of the things that we're going to talk about that after the break, which is called organ vectors and organ values. Now, at this stage, now I'm just going to stop for a very short break. That uh, now, let's move on. Okay, now let's go back and uh, okay, now we are just going to go for the next um, 25 minutes of the this session. Now, look at this one. I just stopped on this slide because I said this is the most important slides for the day, which is about the organ vectors and organ values. There is a little bit, I should say, of the trick when it comes, oh my God, it was too loud, the fan was too loud. Now, there was a, there was a trick, uh, not a trick also, but a little bit more work when it comes to the organ vectors and organ values, when it comes to finding the organ values of a vector. It's a little more work that there is some details of the calculations there. Remember, this is so important to know how to drive them for the purpose of this class. And it's gonna be a part of the assessments that you may have then I'm just gonna walk over that. You have two concepts to finish this session before go, we go for the lunch, a late lunch or the longer break. One of them is the organ vectors, organ values. And the last one is gonna be single value decomposition. Both of them, they have tremendous applications like the one which I said that to you, that you can reduce the dimensionality of the high dimensional spaces, like the gene expressions of the tumorous cancer, uh, cancerous tumor, in order to find the higher variations of, for example, of the genes which are expressed, like we just call that principal component analysis. It's a very important tool in application, principal component analysis, and also spectral clustering that when you come back from your long lunch time break, I'm just gonna have some simulations with them. I'm just gonna show you how to do that. Okay, either today or next week, which is very important in the healthcare and health sciences. Now, but besides from that, now let's jump into some calculations. The simulation has become so easy. You execute the line of the codes, which I'm just gonna give it to you. You see that, wow, well, this is done. Not further, not no need to do something more. Now, when it comes to the organ vectors and organ values, look at that. We said that we have let's say a vector, which we call that V, then we have a matrix and a scalar, A and lambda. Look at that. When you start with the V as a vector, the product of the matrix into that vector 
but you learn how to do the matrix multiplication before on the first half of the course, you see that it, it becomes equal as if the vector is there, but the scalar has been multiplied to that vector. A, V equals lambda V. That's why anytime these instances not happens all the time, there are some specific vectors which they have organ vectors and organ values that this equality exists. If you find a vector V with the matrix A and the scalar lambda, that this equality exists, you call A vector, you call A organ vector, and you call lambda organ value. It's a very important concept, even in the quantum chemistry or quantum physics that do not have that course yet. However, I'm going to talk about these applications, which I denoted there, principal component analysis and spectral clustering. After the long break, I give you some simulation codes. You run it, you see how the things works, which is essentially the applications of this organ value equation. Now, I jump into the numerical examples. Remember, take notes of it if you want, or I'm just you just have the recording after the session. You can make practice to see that how can you just find these two numbers, organ vectors and organ values. I start with uh, uh, a simple matrix, two by two, uh, square matrix for one, two, three. I'm looking for the organ value or organ vectors components of that uh, matrix. It's a little work, but make sure that you do have enough practice of the same thing. For the midterm, it's going to be easy, something similar to that, but you have to follow those steps. Now, the first thing is that I'm looking for the organ vectors and organ value. It does mean that I'm looking for this equation that you see over there. I'm looking for A. Sorry, I'm looking for the V. I'm looking for what? I'm looking for the lambda. Now, the matrix has been given, okay? The matrix has been given, which is four, one, and two, three. Then I'm looking for the organ values first. Then when I find the organ value, I'm just gonna go to find the organ vectors, V from that equation. Now, that's how it works. First, you have to define a characteristic equation. You see on that line, the characteristic equation is this, the determinant of the matrix A minus lambda I, that it has to be equal to zero. That's the deterministic equation. A is a matrix that you have been given on the midterm. For example, you see, I give you the matrix itself, like the one that you have there. Lambda is the organ value, which we have no idea how much is that. And I is the identity matrix, okay? Now, we know what is A. And we know what is I, identity matrix. I talked about that, is a matrix that has all the elements as a square matrix, that all the elements are zero, except the elements on the diagonal, which is one. If the matrix A is two by two matrix, the identity matrix also has to be two by two, because you remember from the first half of the class, we said that if you want to subtract two matrices, or add two matrices, you have to have the equal ranking of those two matrices in order to do so. Then as a result, if A is a two by two matrix, I, I need the matrix is two by two matrix as well. Now, I'm just gonna build it. On this slide, you see what happened. I'm still with the characteristic equation, A determinant of the A minus lambda I equals to zero. Or the determinant, I still have it there because you have to reach to the final square matrix to find the determinants. For the A, I substituted with the matrix which I had for one, two, three. Lambda, look at the characteristic equation, minus lambda A. I kept the lambda there, but the A, I, which is identity matrix remains there as it is. You see that's a two by two matrix. All the elements are zero, except the elements of the diagonal, which is one and one. That's why we call that identity matrix. Now, you have to simplify that. How to do that? First, the priority goes with the lambda. Lambda is a scalar as an organ value. Then the first, you have to take it inside the matrix. If you multiply lambda as a matrix, 
into the identity matrix, lambda times zero becomes zero, lambda times becomes one. Then you have a matrix, which is lambda zero, zero lambda. Your original matrix is four, one, two, three. They are subtracted. Then you have four minus lambda, two minus zero, which is two, one minus zero becomes one, and three minus lambda becomes three minus lambda. Then you, subs you simplify that to that. Still remember, I'm looking for the determinants of this one. In order to find the determinants, you see that the diagonal elements, four minus lambda times three minus lambda has to be multiplied sub three minus two minus one, which becomes zero. If you see that, you see if you have this equation, you go to this one. This is essentially what, what do I have there? It's the quadratic equation to solve it. I'm just gonna do this here on the board in order to remind you of what happened there. Because uh, what was the original one? The original matrix was, I'm doing this quickly here. The original matrix was what? How much was that was four? One, two and three. This is the original matrix that we have, okay? And I'm just gonna show you how to get to that uh, line that we have. This is the original matrix that we had. For this one, I said that what is the organ vectors and what is the organ value of that thing? Let me just do that on the whiteboard, which I have, because I wanna see, make sure that this is properly into the coordinates. I forgot I have this one. Let me stop the share. Let me. Go to the whiteboard. Now. Okay, please uh, listen very carefully to see how I do proceed because that's going to be something that you have it for the midterm assessment, but with the different numbers. Okay, I said that I'm just going to start with the matrix, which is A, which comes with the element 4, 1. And 2 and 3. Okay, this is a matrix. For example, on the assessment, probably it's the vector, for example, of, uh, it's a matrix of pixel intensities of the MRI scans of the person with the brain tumor. For example, you're going to see as a project later. But we just start by this as a simple example. What I'm looking for is the organ vector and organ value. What does it mean? It means that I'm looking for this characteristic. I said that if my matrix is A, I'm looking into the vector V, which the product becomes what? Becomes the lambda still V. This is the organ equation. With the V, we, we call that organ vector. With the lambda, we call that organ value. In order to solve this, you see that you can take it over there to the left. You say AV minus lambda V should be equal to zero. What did I do? I took the something from the right side to the left side. Okay, now, then you see that I can just take the A, take V as a common thing from there. Then you say you have A, minus lambda, which equals to zero. Now, the question is that V is a vector, A is a matrix, lambda is a scalar number. Now we have a problem. We say that in order to find the organ value, the thing which I have to do is that I have to find this equation to solve this equation. But there is a problem. The problem which we have here is this. We have A as a matrix, an array of the numbers, but 
I have gamma as a scalar, like for example, number three, then there is no way I'm going to be able to subtract a matrix from a number, only a one number. It's impossible. There is no compatibility. Then there is one problem here. Then there is a second problem here. There is one problem, which is this. There's a second problem. The second problem is that, imagine if you resolve this issue, we have two things multiplied to each other, which became zero, which means that, remember from maybe elementary school, if you have an equation like alpha times beta equals to zero, it means that you have two expressions one alpha, one beta, they multiply together, it becomes zero. It means that in that case, there are two possibilities. Either alpha becomes zero or beta should become zero. This is, this is a logical thing. Two things become zero multiplied, either of them should have been zero. Like zero times five bec becomes zero. If that's the rule that we remember, if I go back to this equation that we have, it means that either V should be equal to zero or A minus lambda, still there's a problem, has to become to zero. Still lambda cannot be subtracted. We said that, okay, there are two possibilities. Now, there are two possibilities. However, if I come with this conclusion that possibly V can be zero, it means that I'm going to be in trouble because if V is going to be zero, my assumption was that V exists because V is the Ogen vector. You're going to see what do I mean later when I'm done with all the calculation. But in this problem, when someone gave me the matrix A, I assume that I can find the organ vectors for that. And what is the organ vector V? And if I come to this conclusion that maybe V is zero, I, I deny myself of that. Then it means that I assume that V exists. That's why I'm looking for it. But I came over there to say, oh, I conclude V is equal to zero. That's the trouble. Then as a result, this part is not a valid thing then as a result, the only option which I can rely is gonna be this, that the matrix itself minus the alpha minus gamma should be zero, but it still has a problem itself because A is a matrix, gamma is a number, they cannot be subtracted unless I play a smart, how huh, to introduce I here, which is identity matrix. Now, Gamma times I, it forms a matrix. Gamma is a scalar. I is, let's say, uh, identity matrix with the same ranking as the A, means two by two. In this case, I becomes what? It has to be two by two. One here, zero here, zero here, one. Now, lambda times I becomes lambda zero, zero lambda. And now it's a matrix. A is a matrix also, but you cannot come to say both of them become zero because A minus I gamma, I gamma I becomes zero. It's impossible to solve it unless if I say that the determinant of this expression becomes zero. And that's how we just got to this characteristic equation. Determinant of A minus gamma I becomes zero. That's the one that you had on those slides, and I call that characteristic equation. For the midterm exam, you do not need to drive goal, those kind of stuff. Only start with the deterministic equation, characteristic equation, right? Determinant of A minus gamma I becomes zero. Now, let me add a page. And that's how, so far what did I do was that I wanted to show, let me add a page, yes. So how did I get that characteristic equation? Now, again, go back. 
to the same matrix that I had. It was four, one, two, and three. I'm looking for the organ vectors and organ value. What I'm going to do is this. I'm looking at this equation, determinant of A minus lambda I should be zero. You had that on those slides. What is A? It is four, one. Still, I have determinants. Four, one, two, three. Minus lambda I, one, zero, zero, one. Should be zero. For this one, it is very easy. You see that the lambda that we have, you have to take it inside the matrix. Then the equation that you get at the end becomes this becomes determinant of this one. Four, one, two, and three, minus gamma times one becomes gamma, gamma times zero becomes zero, it becomes zero, it becomes gamma, becomes zero. Because gamma expand in everything, gamma times one becomes gamma, gamma times zero becomes zero. Then now you have two matrices. Both of them are the same ranking. This matrix has two rows, two columns. It becomes two by two. This matrix has two rows, two columns. It becomes two by two again. Then as a result, you see that these two matrices come with the same ranking of the same type. Then you can subtract them together naturally. Then it becomes what? Becomes determinant of if you subtract them, elements by elements, you subtract them, as long as they have the same ranking. 4 minus lambda becomes the first element. 1 minus 0 becomes 1. 2 minus 0 becomes 2. 3 minus lambda, we have 3 minus lambda becomes 0. Now, you have to find the determinants of this. Remember, on the previous slides, before we just went for the break, we discussed that as a note. I'm just going to write it as a note. The determinant of matrix A, B, C, D becomes what? A times D minus B times C. This is a note how to find the determinants of the square matrix of ranking two. If that's the case, look at this one. This matrix is also a rank two matrix. Am I right? Then as a result, I'm gonna follow this through. It means that I have to multiply these two elements, which makes it what? Four, let me change the color. becomes four minus lambda times three minus lambda, like the one which I did, I had A, I had D, multiplied them, and I subtract C times D, means that minus one times two becomes two. I knew that the determinant should go to zero, I equate it to zero. Huh? So far so good? Huh? Then as a result, when I have this equation, I have to solve this in order to find the value for the lambda, which is the organ value. In order to do that, how to do that? Look at these two expressions. I have to multiply them. That becomes a basic algebraic equation. I'm going to write it here. I say 4 times 3 becomes how much? 12. Look at 4. You multiply once to three becomes 12. You multiply once to the minus gamma becomes minus four gamma. Now you have, let me choose a different color. You have gamma times three becomes minus three gamma. Gamma times minus gamma minus gamma times minus gamma becomes plus gamma squared 
becomes how much? Zero. Now, I have to make, and also, sorry, minus two. Look at the minus two here. And I have minus two equals to zero. Now, you see everything is all over the place. We have to do some kind of minor simplification. How to do the simplification? I have 12 minus two, the same thing becomes 10. I have minus four gamma, minus three gamma, awesome, minus seven gamma. Anything else is left there? Plus gamma squared becomes zero. That's what we get there. Huh? Now, okay, with this equation, somebody remember this one. I'm just going to change the page, go to the next one. You recite it for me, please. Uh, thank you. Okay, what was the equation? Gamma squared equals to zero. Thank you. And now, guys, look at that. For this equation that we have over there, what do we have is just, I'm just going to write a note here. Don't worry, we are just going to, next five minutes, we are just going to go for the break. This equation, look at that. Everybody remembers this equation from elementary school, ax squared plus bx plus c equals to zero, quadratic equation. Remember that, high school? Do you remember we said that in order to solve it, we find this equation, quadratic equation, x becomes minus b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4a times c divided by two times a. Do you remember that? High school, you had the quadratic equation. Quadratic equation can be that type of solution. Remember that? Look at him, he says, yes. <laughs> now, I'm just gonna use this. If this is the note, I'm gonna use it to solve for the gamma. Then if gonna be that, I'm just gonna use this one. In this equation, which I have, 10 is acts like the C, minus seven acts like the B. Well, how much is A if you compare this to this equation? A is one, huh? Then gamma, which I have, in this equation is minus B. How much is B? Minus seven. Minus, minus seven becomes plus seven plus or minus the square root of b squared. How much was b? Seven. Seven times seven, 49. For a c, how much is a? One. How much is c? 10. 10 times one times four, 40. Divided by two times a. How much is a? One. Two times one becomes, guys, thank you for artistic writing there. Let me just write there. <laughs> becomes two. How did you do that? That was very artistic. Now, now I have this equation. I have to come to simplify that. Then I simplify that, then we just take a break. I have plus, seven over there, I cannot do anything with that, I keep it there, plus or minus square root of, inside the square root, 49 minus 40, nine times two, divided by two. Now, you say, uh-oh, look at that, square root of nine, it's so easy, the easiest part of the today's lecture, three, then I can simplify that further, plus seven, plus or minus three divided by how much? Two. Now, 
Look at that. I say gamma comes with this one. If you remember, with one equation, I just go with the positive sign on top. 7 plus 3 becomes how much? 10. Ten. Divided by 2 becomes 5. 7 minus 3, 4. Divided by 2, 2. And we are done. Then as a result, we got two organ values. One lambda is plus 5. One lambda, lambda prime is plus 2. And this part of the equation is solved. And we stop right now there. The thing that you saw on those slides, which I came to exactly the same numbers, this is essentially what I did right now. It was a very simple one. I used the characteristic equation to get there. Any questions so far? Everyone's OK? OK, let me stop. Now, look at this. I, 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 in this slide, you saw not as many details as I showed it on the whiteboard. You have the quadratic equation for lambda. You got the end results at the bottom of the page. You see the five and two that we got. Now, give me one more minute before we finish. At this stage, you saw that what we did, we got the lambda, the organ values. We also need the organ vectors, which is going to be after we come back from the break then. Okay, now, as I said, we just found the organ values and organ vectors, no, sorry, organ values. The thing that we were looking for was that also, because what's the point of doing all this stuff? Because with the characteristic equation, what we had there, we had also the organ values, which it was the, the gamma, the lambda, sorry, which you find lambda one and lambda two on this slide before we just went for the break. The next thing that we did in that characteristic equation was the presence of the organ vectors, V. We had A times V equals lambda times V. Lambda was decided on before we just went for the break. What we need to do right now is that to find the organ vectors. Now, organ vectors, the key thing is that the organ vectors they have to correspond to the organ values that we find. Then as a result, if we were able to find two organ values, lambda one and lambda two, it means that we have to necessarily look for two organ vectors, which is V1 and V2. And that's, that's, the, that's the important characteristics of the thing that you wanna do. Now, the reminder of the session, we are looking for the, to find the organ vectors. The first, I'm just gonna first choose the first organ value, which I had. My first organ value, lambda one was five. Then it's gonna to correspond to first organ vectors, which I'm just gonna call that V1, okay? Now, in order to find this, remember our characteristic equation. What was our characteristic equation? Remember, it was, remember, A, A minus, gamma i equals to zero. Do you remember that? Before the class on the whiteboard, I showed that. Now, A is a given matrix because we have been given that matrix, which is four, one, two, three. Now, A, also we had gamma. The first gamma we found it, and that's the trick. You have to always start with finding the organ values rather than going to the organ vectors. The organ value was five, then I have five instead of the lambda, and I is given there. 
I is a very easy organ value. Uh, sorry, a very easy matrix to remember. The matrix with the same ranking as the A, which is two by two. And at the same time, all elements are zero except the dying elements, which is one. Then as a result, if you just want to solve it and multiplies to V equals to zero. And at the same time, I'm just going to put everything there. For the matrix A, this is four, one, two, and three. Five times I means that five, five at the diagonal, then becomes four minus five, three minus five at the diagonal, when you expand it, and one and two is there. Times V, V is the organ vector that we have. And V, do you want me to write that on a whiteboard? Yes, I think that's gonna be much better. Let me stop the share. Let me go to the whiteboard. Okay. We had the matrix here, A. It was four, one, two, and three. What we discussed was this one, the organ value equation, matrix A times organ value, organ vector V should equal lambda organ value times organ vector V. This is the equation that we had. Remember, in order to simplify that, I just came with this simplification that A V minus gamma V should equal to zero. I factorized V and I write this one A minus lambda times V equal to zero. And you remember, we run into a trouble because A is a matrix. Lambda is a scalar. This, there is no compatibility to subtract them. Then as a result, I introduced the unit vector there, unit matrix. Now, that's what I'm going to do. Then I'm just going to start from here in order to find the V. Remember, the first thing, step number one, we had lambda one equals to five, one of the organ values that I got. I'm just gonna take it there. Look what happens. Now, if this is the case, what is a matrix A? I'm just gonna solve this one from there. That's right, four, one, two, three. Now, it comes, look at the sign here, minus gamma, sorry, lambda. How much is lambda in that scenario? Five. What is the I? Exactly, thank you, one, zero, one. Not equal, because look at that, because let me also erase this line there. Everything comes multiplies to what? To V. That's right. Equals to zero. I'm going to simplify that further. Look at this one here. I have the scalar five, which is multiplied into a matrix. It means that it has to distribute itself all over the place with all elements. It means that it has to be multiplied to this. It has to be multiplied to this, multiplied to this, and multiplied to this. If that happens, how can I simplify that further? I have four, one, two, three, huh? minus exactly, thank you, five, zero, zero, five, Everything is multiplied to V equals to zero. Adita, wasn't you? Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, I, that's... <laughs> Un unconsciously, it just... Oh, it should be Adita. <laughs> I had no control of it, sorry. <laughs> now, no. look at this one. What do I have here? I have two matrices. One of them is the ranking two, two rows, two columns, two by two. I have the second matrix, 
Again, this is two by two. The ranking is the same. The reason means that there is a compatibility to do the subtraction. Then as a result, if I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna simplify that. Element wise, I'm gonna subtract as long as there is a compatibility of the ranking. The element four here has to be subtracted from each element, five corresponding elements. Four minus five becomes how much? Minus one. Corresponding to one, what element is this? Zero. One minus zero becomes how much? One, put it plus one. Corresponding element to two, which element is that? Zero. Two minus zero becomes two. Corresponding element to three, five. Three minus five becomes minus two. Thank you. Now, this is, this is the result of subtraction there. However, it is multiplied to this vector here. Do you see this vector? V equals to zero. And the question is this, V is a vector. What I have shown there is something, a symbol of a vector. You have to identify the scale of it. Now, then as a result, what I'm gonna do is this. I'm just gonna erase V. I should have written at the bottom. I do not have space. I'm just gonna do that uh, as a separate then. Then you see that when you, let me choose a color, a cool one. Look at that. What is the ranking of this vector? Two by two, am I right? It is multiplied to a vector, which is V. I have to guess its dimension. Remember on the previous slides, at the very first one before we just go for all our breaks. Do you remember I said that if there is a matrix like that. Do you remember I said that there is gonna be one quick check that the number of the columns of this matrix, which is two, in order to be compatible for multiplication should equal with the number of the rows of this matrix. Do you remember that? You also had it from the high school, I guess. huh? If the matrix that you have is two by two, the, the vector V that you are building, the, its dimension should be compatible with that. It means the first thing is that it has to have two rows because look at that two and two, they should be compatible. You see, the number of the columns of the first matrix should be equal to the number of the rows of the second vector. Means if this is two, it has to be two there means two times, I can have two times three or anything. We kind of do two, one. We say that one is arbitrary, we choose one for simplification. It means that the vector V which I'm building should come with what? A vector which has two rows, one columns. Huh? Then I can write it as V1, V2. I guess that the elements should be like that. Huh? The elements, I guess, should be like that. Because if the matrix is going to be two by one, it means two rows, one columns. You can write, for example, if, if you do not feel comfortable writing V1 or V2, you say, ah, oh, how do I know? Should I call it what? You can call it anything. You can call the first one apple, the second one, for example, orange. It doesn't matter. Anything you can call it, as long as you can keep track of it. But now I'm just going to call that V1 and V2. I call to one, V1 and V2. Now, the resulting elements, you see the multiplication, look at this from here, from the top, comes to zero matrix, zero matrix. Zero matrix means that the end result is going to be two and two. They match compatibility. The end result becomes this dimension two and one. 
becomes two times one you get it from there. These two ones that they match, you remove it, the resulting dimension becomes the things that they are left. Two from the first matrix, one from the second matrix. Then it becomes again a two by one matrix, which has to be a zero matrix. It means each element has to be zero. Does it make so, sense so far? No? Last step, from which one? The white zero or how did I? Uh, look at that. Look at from the top here. Look at this one. A minus lambda IV becomes zero. What is zero there? Look at that A is a matrix. Gamma A is a matrix. V is a matrix. Then you cannot have, for example, you cannot mix two matrices to get one scalar. It's as if you cannot mix, let's say, for example, you want to plan for, what do you have planned for dinner tonight? You're going to cook something. Can you expect that, for example, you mix chicken with vegetables? Then, for example, oh, you are vegetarian, huh? For example, imagine you're adding two different vegetables, even better. Imagine you add two different vegetables tonight for dinner. You come back after half an hour of cooking. You open the bowl. You see, oh, there is a chicken in there. Can it happen? No. Then as a result, you cannot expect to have matrices mixed. You open the bowl. You see, oh, you have a scalar. It's impossible. As impossible as like you mix two vegetables, you come back after half an hour, you open the bowl, you say, oh, there is a boiling chicken inside. Then as you, if you have a zero, it has to be a matrix itself because everything there is matrix. Zero is going to be a matrix, not a number. If it's a matrix, means that all elements of it has to be zero. What is a zero matrix? A matrix, which it is everywhere zero. Yes, zero everywhere. All elements are zero. Then if the resulting answer has to be a matrix of two by one, which has to be a zero matrix, it means that oh, everything has to be zero. Huh? Then that's the reason. The, the resulting answer, it shows it by zero by, everything is zero. Zero there, zero there. Zero matrix means all elements are zero. Do you understand why the ranking of the resulting elements is two by one? Did you get that? No? Let me let me remind you here. Let me remind you something that we did it before we just went for the break. I'm gonna do this one, then we just go for uh, a short break, then we come back to finish it, then by five we go home. Look at this one. If you have two matrices, the first matrix has a ranking, which is N row and M column. Are you good so far? Yes. You multiply that to another matrix, which I'm gonna call it B. You cannot multiply any matrix to any matrix. We said that the key for multiplication is this, that the coming matrix should come with the M. What does it mean? It means that the number of the columns of the first matrix should match the number of the rows of the second matrix. Make sense so far? M can be five. Means two times five, five times anything, any number, but they have to match. Multiply two, any number, I'm going to call it P. You see these two numbers are equal? There is a compatibility now for multiplying of the matrices. As long as it happens, it means that, oh, you can go to multiply these two matrices together. If this is happens, you see that the resulting matrix, which I'm going to call it C, has its own dimension. What is the dimension? I say the M that they are compatible, you kick them out. You say, your task is done. You, you guided us. 
that I can multiply these two matrices, then we'll work with you. I'm just going to play with the things which they are left. Then, that's right, it becomes M times P. This has become the ranking of the resulting matrix. As an example, for example, A is a matrix of 2 times 3 multiplies to a matrix of B. What is the dimension of B? Look at this is 3. It has to be 3 times, for example, 5. It becomes C. What is the ranking? Look at this one. 3 and 3 are equal. Means compatibility. The C resulting one becomes how much? 2 and 5. The last example. We have a matrix, but I'm going to call it M. It is 2 times 4 multiplies to the matrix N, which becomes 2 times 4. What is the end result? Look at this. This is 4. This is 2. Oh, my God. There is no compatibility. Did it mean that? You do whatever you want. You spend hours, you cannot multiply them. Means that there is no answer for that. Make sense? Now, then I go back to the previous slide. Look at this one. This is the, do you remember so far what, where did I get that one? Two by two. We guess that it's gonna be two by one. You see compatible two and two. Then the end result becomes what? Two and one, the things which are left. Does it make sense so far? Everyone's happy, happy, happy? Yes. yes? Now, but we know that the resulting matrix has to be a zero matrix because everywhere we have a zero. If you doubt that, check the vegetables when you cook it to see if you get the chicken or vegetables at the end. Then matrix should be a matrix. If this is zero matrix, means all elements are gonna be zero. Two by one zero becomes zero here and zero there. Make sense? Now, then the next step that we had to do is what? Is to do, what time is it now? Don't wanna take a 10 minutes break, then we come back to finish it? Yes? Let me take a picture of. Now, <clears throat> okay, we have uh, just the very last five minutes of the class. We are just gonna finish with what we did so far to find the organ vectors of the problem that they were trying to find. First of all, on the whiteboard which I used, I took it all the way to there. Look at this one. Four minus five, one, two, three minus five, times the organ vector, I called it V1 and V2. Here, I have shown it as X1 and X2, the same thing, but the notes that you took it's just exactly there. You see the simplification, minus one, one, two, minus two, x1, x2. Okay, what we did before. Now this is the simplification. And for the organ vectors, I have x1 and x2. It's the v1 and v2. You can call it anything, apple and orange. Now, you see, you have a system of the matrices. You have the multiplication. In order to multiply that, it becomes an equation a system of equation that you did it maybe before the high school. Look at the first matrix. Before we just went for the break, we saw that these two matrices are compatible for multiplication because one of them is two by two, the other one is two by one, then you end up by a zero matrix which is two by one itself. Huh? Remember that before the break? The first matrix minus one, one, two, minus two times x1, x2. We expand this multiplication from the high school. 
you remember it becomes minus 1 times x1 plus 1 times x2 first row of the first matrix to the first column which is x1 x2 the second equation becomes the second row times the column 2x1 minus 2x2 becomes 0 why becomes 0 do you, do you get what what happened there yes huh yes awesome then because 0 on the right side is a zero matrix if you remember as what we discussed before we just go for the break zero matrix means the matrix which all the elements are zero there then it becomes zero now the thing is that we have to find this equation we have to find this the first look at the first equation x1 minus x1 plus x2 gives you zero look at the first equation on the top minus x1 plus x2 becomes zero you take one to the other side gets x1 equals x2 very easy huh then as a result you see that if you choose the organ vector five which we did it so far in order to simplify that the organ vectors which you get because you guessed the organ vector is x1 and x2 that's what you guessed uh, because we didn't know that, we called them x1 and x2, a vector 2 by 1. You see the elements of that vector, all of them are equal. x1 should equal to x2. That becomes what? The organ vector. Then as a result, you can say that, okay, v1, the organ vector that you had becomes what? The x1 and x2 are equal. It can be anything. It can be one and one, it can be two and two, it can be three and three, anything as long as x1 and x2 are equal. Huh? Then you can come with the organ vector v1, corresponding to organ value lambda one, which was five becomes one and one, for example. I'm gonna repeat the same thing because remember we had two organ vectors and two organ values. For the second organ value, the got it as how much as two then if i want to go back and just solve the characteristic equations for the organ value i do the same thing as i did for organ value as five which we did it before the break for that case we said a minus lambda a times b equals to zero now lambda is two i replace it by two remember what i did on the whiteboard before we just went for the break i expanded those things and we just got it simplified like that are you okay with that or do you want me to stop sure go back to the watch or do the same thing everyone is okay with that yeah. no questions awesome then you see that if you do that you simplify that further the second organ value that vector that you get becomes x1 and x2 the same thing you do this you expand it Adita, oh, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> completely unconsciously said. <laughs> now, you expand it, becomes 2x1 times x2 equals to 0, and all the equations becomes 2. Then you get x2 equals minus 2x1. It means that if you choose x1 as x1, the x2 becomes minus 2x1. If you choose x1 as 1, you get the organ vector as one and minus two. Does it make sense? Or do you want me to just go back to the whiteboard to do that for you? That's okay for everyone? That's fantastic. Then the ending thing for today is this, that we got for the matrix that we just started with. Look at that. The matrix was this. Matrix A, four, one, two, three. With all this stuff, at the bottom of the page, you see that I just organ value lambda one. We got it five with corresponding organ vector one and one. And the organ value lambda two with the corresponding vector as one and minus two. Now, these two organ vectors, bless you. Next week, you are going to see that these organ vectors are orthogonal to each other. Okay. Orthogonal to each other. And they build the building blocks 
of what we call principal component analysis, which is a very, very, very important application. The next session that we have, I bring you some simulations method. I'm just gonna work you with you and walk you through that. I give you the code itself. You're gonna see that you only need, use your mouse to copy a line, paste it somewhere, press a button. Then you see the end results and you see the visualization. And all the things that we do next session, it all relies on the things that you learned right now, which is tremendous. And that it brings us to the end of the session. Any question? Any concern? Any suggestion? No, sir. Any complaints? No, sir. No? <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna then uh, stop the session.